what we do in my laboratory is that we combine the 3D printer with an electro spinner. So we have this uh, nozzle, so basically just a, ma a medical needle uh, we have, and we put a high voltage on this. We also tweak the chemistry, so the fibers, they will repel each other a lot. So we have some fluffy material, and we can make a 3D material. I have a video uh, how we make it, so let me play this uh, video to you. So you can see my PhD student uh, first turning off uh, the setup and starting, and then increasing the voltage, the high voltage that is on this uh, medical needle. Here, there is the needle. So basically, we are just uh, increasing the voltage here. And you can see that first, you have a 2D deposition on the grounded plate. And uh, once you have your deposition, since the chemistry of these polymer fibers that they are repelling each other, they will form this uh, fluffy structure. And actually here, we are still trying to understand the mechanism, which we still don't know. So here we just put a crocodile clip of uh, five kilowatts, high voltage, and change the polarity between positive and negative. We wanted to check if they repel or attract these charged nanofibers. So this is a real-time video. And of course, you cannot see that the fibers are on a nanoscale with your bare eyes. But if you put it in the scanning electron microscope, you can see that these fibers are around 600 nanometers. So this is a very uh, easy way to make uh, 3D structures. And some, for some applications, we put this in a tube furnace, we carbonize it, and we are making batteries, fuel cells, or supercapacitors. But some applications, we are also putting it in a cell culture media, and we are trying to make it into an organ. So advantages of uh, electrospinning is that it's inexpensive. Even this 3D electrospinning, what you could see, we built it uh, for less than 5,000 pounds. You can operate it at atmospheric conditions. Again, you don't need vacuum. You don't need high pressure. And normally, you can operate it also at room temperature. You can, uh, possible, uh, you can uh, control the fiber morphology. And actually, we can also, with this combination of with the 3D printing, we can make it into different shapes. And you can use practically any type of polymer. If you put honey in a syringe and you put the high voltage, actually, you can make nanofibers of honey. So you can make these sugar fibers. It's very simple. But I don't uh, suggest you to try it at home. Disadvantages. I can't really think about many disadvantages, except that uh, some materials, they only dissolve uh, in toxic solvents. So I would say that's the only disadvantage. And it has relatively high variables. Normally, we talk about five process parameters, like what's the distance, what is the voltage, what is the concentration of your solute, and so on. So I want to talk about different uh, technique, which I already mentioned, which is plasma. And actually, this is uh, exactly what I was told when I started my PhD a few years ago. My supervisor showed me something like this, but it was in a laboratory setting, and told me that, uh, Norbert, we have a problem. This works fine. We can have nanoparticles, but the deposition rate is very low, because it's in a volume. It's called a volume plasma. So most of the aerosol doesn't even see the plasma. So I was making it into a sandwich. It's uh, hard to visualize it, but this is just the top view of my sandwich. So I made a plate. We uh, basically put some electrodes uh, of uh, platinum, and we injected argon gas and uh, our uh, distilled molecules. So I just uh, put the molecules uh, into this liquid. So we used high pressure and the nozzle from a liquid, which the liquid was acetone. And we put uh, the interesting molecule, we wanted to make it into nano size. And basically, it was just uh, like a sandwich. The aerosol, I just made a nozzle. And the aerosol was in a 2D uh, thin film. It was going above the plasma. So instead of having this volume, now we had a good uh, interaction. Because you can see, this is actually an actual photo I took of my plasma. Here are my electrodes and the plasma as micro discharges, they are going on the surface to left and right. So if this is the electrode, imagine that there are micro discharges to both directions. And with this, basically all your aerosol is meeting with the plasma, except the ones that travel right above the thin films of the electrode. 
But still, this one gives probably around 80% uh, interaction rate. And with this, we could have a much higher yield than with the volume type of plasma like this. So also, you can use plasma to uh, synthesize in vacuum arc deposition, which is actually uh, similar. But here, you are talking about a 3D plasma. And uh, you can just uh, think about an arc. So this is an arc. So you can use this arc, again, to charge your uh, whatever uh, material you put in as an aerosol. And uh, this is also used as a cheap way of synthesis of nanomaterials. So uh, you can also use microfluidics. It's a very hot topic, especially in the health applications. So if you have heard about microfluidic nanoparticle synthesis, it means that uh, you have microfluidic channel where uh, you are putting also some mineral oil to in a different, let's say, in a this way. So if your, uh, your material is traveling in this direction, you can put some oil, and then you can make these spheres to make very small droplets. This, of course, doesn't work with, uh, it won't be a solid, so you are making liquid small nano droplets with this technique. If you can uh, make sure that the mineral oil is coming at the right time and the right volume. So basically, you are just breaking this uh, solution, which is here a polymeric solution. You are breaking it with the mineral oil into spheres. Yes, question? So how does that work if you put a can make nano-sized droplets if that's not going to be a nano-sized? So uh, it's a good question. So we call it microfluidic because normally the tubes are in a micron range. So if the tube here, let's say, is one micron, then your uh, droplets you are making is submicron, which, again, some definitions say it's nano size. But with this technique, of course, you won't make really small particles. But also remember that here, uh, your droplets uh, are still a solution. So you, it's still not a solidified. If you can solidify it, it will be much smaller. So again, if you go back to the uh, electro spray, your droplets that are ejected from the nozzle are still many, many micron, maybe 40, 50 micron, but they shrink, and then they will crystallize, and then the crystal will be. Just imagine that if uh, only two weight percent or two volume percent of your material is the solute, then that's what at the end will be. So basically by isolating your reactors, making your reactor really small, then you can have really tiny nanoparticles, nanocrystals at the end. But uh, in this case, actually, uh, here uh, we still keep it. So as you can see, here we still keep it in a dissolved phase. So many times, Michael Chan will tell more about it for medical applications. You don't want crystals. You want it to be as a colloidal solution. And uh, that's what is the aim many times. So many times uh, you are just using uh, this to make a uniform monodisperse, you can see here also, it's a nice monodisperse, you can see here the size distribution of these uh, spheres, and then later uh, it will have different applications. Okay, so let's stand up again, so freshen up for a minute. to shake your arms and legs. All right, if everyone is awake again, then let's continue with a different uh, topic. So talking about uh, synthesis, just very briefly, I want to mention that you can also use some green or biological synthesis methods. So you can use uh, bacteria with a reduction, so it can reduce some material, or you can use a uh, fungi, so a fungus can use a uh, bioabsorption, or you can actually use plants, which uh, can uh, use this enzyme mediation method to make uh, nanoparticles. So actually, just an example, a suggested mechanism for making gold uh, nanoparticles is this bioreduction that by bacteria. And basically, you can make uh, this uh, uh, electron transfer from the NADH molecule to NAD+. And then uh, this will reduce, and this is how we, you can use it as a reducing agent when you are making gold 
or silver or platinum or copper nanoparticles. So if you think about a fungus, it can actually use, be used to make, for instance, a quantum dots of cadmium selenide. So again, uh, fungi can be used in some application to make uh, these nanoparticles. So if you think about plants, uh, you can just think that uh, there are some plants that are actually naturally producing nanoparticles. So there is this plant. You don't need to remember the name. This plant gets them uh, make actually uh, silver and gold nanoparticles. So what you really need to know is that uh, carbon nanotubes are very important, as I mentioned many times before. And I told you that you can make carbon nanotubes with ball milling. But actually, most of the time, carbon nanotubes are synthesized with uh, bottom-up methods. And also, I mentioned to you that you need to know that there are two types of carbon nanotubes. They can be single-walled or uh, multi-walled. So this is the TEM image. Normally, it's very hard to uh, see. But the TEM, uh, the electrons can basically see through because the carbon nanotubes are so small. You can see here that this is only uh, 3 nanometers, so it's really small. And this is the single wall of a carbon nanotube. Single wall carbon nanotubes are really hard to make. Most of the times we have these uh, multi wall carbon nanotubes. This is a cross section. So you can see here that the wall is only 0 0.3 nanometer. So it's really thin. It's just uh, one sheet of uh, uh, graphite. But uh, you cannot make a carbon nanotube by stacking a sheet of uh, graphene. You cannot basically fold the graphene sheet but uh, you are using some different methods.